talking about, as you can see, is somewhat of a complement to what, what Matt was talking about. So what Matt was talking about, obviously, was how to get the cells of a particular type that you want. And this whole notion of using the cells um, and drug discovery, things like that, was not what initially people thought about in regenerative medicine. So let me also say parenthetically that I'm going to use this as an opportunity to not so much give you details, though I'll, I'll do that, but more to give you a philosophy and a view of how we should approach regenerative medicine. Because after you get all the cells that Matt talked about, what do you do with them? And what most people think about is to take them and put them where they are or where they're needed. And it's not as easy as we think, or it's certainly not as easy as we envisioned kind of in the late 80s and, and early 90s is happening. And that's what I'm going to be talking about, kind of the challenges and the revelations that have come out of cell therapy. Now, I think it's important to recognize that regenerative medicine, and including the stem cell field, came, grew out of developmental biology. It was developmental biologists that happened upon stem cells. And uh, I include myself as a developmental biologist. We always viewed stem cells as simply part of a developmental program. And meaning that what stem cells were meant to do in the body is put the system together and then maintain homeostasis. The way it did that was many, many different mechanisms, only one of which was cell replacement. But harnessing all of those, which involve a huge amount of crosstalk, is really what one needs to harness if you're interested in cell therapy. So cell therapy really is just translational developmental biology. And then if, even if all you really care about is fixing a patient, you can't do it without understanding the fundamental biology of these developmental programs and figuring out how to harness them. And it's tough, and it's complex. So what we've learned is that when you take a stem cell and you put it into a pathologic region, there's a dynamic. Both things change. The stem cell changes, and the host changes. And they change in response to these kind of arrows. And it's understanding these arrows that is actually the heart of at least cell therapy that employs uh, stem cells. So I don't think it needs to be said to this audience, but I want to reiterate it as well, that a true stem cell biologist really does not make a distinction necessarily between whether you're working in adult stem cells, or embryonic stem cells, or neonatal stem cells. It's merely, merely a continuum. It's a continuum from cells over here that do not yet know what their address is meant to be uh, to cells over here that are still exceedingly plastic. They still have to put the organ together, but at least now they know they're meant to be living in the nervous system or the bone marrow or the heart. And then, of course, out here where they're already committed. Now, whether you're working out over here or you're working out over here, you're still focusing on what's going on over here. Over here, you're trying to uh, teach yourself that it's meant to be living. If you're working out here, you're meant to, you're trying to fool yourself into thinking that it's living over there. But it's studying this that is going to be the key to cell therapy. So watch this, why you have to understand that. And then of course, as Matt talked about, we started learning surprisingly that this continuum not only goes from left to right, but also from right to left. But still, the challenges remain the same. And, you know, getting pluripotent stem cells through the more traditional ES way, it's kind of funny talking about a field that's only been, you know, a little over 10 years old as traditional versus this other one. And I, I would be remiss and I'd be yelled at at my home institution if I didn't mention, even though I'm not going to talk about it though, that we also do a lot of IPS technology using disease in the dish, uh, disease in the dish biology, either normal cells and stressing them or derived from, from, uh, from patients. And in our core, we've actually made probably close to 200 disease modeling IPS cells, which go into our, our uh, screening center and get subjected to stressors or compound libraries that can find some kind of informative phenotype. And I see TJ here, and he would be very proud of my showing that this is one of our work does. I'm not going to talk about that, 
everyone that needs it just to do that as an advertisement. But we get all of these kind of uh, differentiated progeny from the pluripotent stem cells, whether it's iPS cells or ES cells. And then the question is, how does one use them? And what I want to mention is that there are a lot of people on the base. This is just a partial list of people each working in these various areas of trying to take their cell from a pluripotent stem cell and stick it where it may do cell replacement. And that's usually what people think of here. Now, you know that iPS cells or <coughs> pluripotent stem cells can be problematic. One way that Pam Itkin and Sari and other people from um, working in the pancreas have decided to deal with that, and this is another part of cell therapy, is to stick them in, uh, in, 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 in capsules that either that protect the cell in case they do become tumorigenic or also protect them from rejection from the system. But what I want to do is I want to talk more about actually right over here because this is when you actually have a cell down a particular lineage. How are you going to use it in a deficient uh, system? Now, I'm, even though we do all kinds of organ systems now in our group, I'm trained as a neurobiologist. I'm going to use the nervous system as an example from this point on, but I think you can extrapolate to your organ of interest. Now, it's interesting. We used to believe that we didn't need to know anything about the cells. Really. All we needed to do was have the host select this multipotent cell from a smorgasbord and say exactly what this host needed, and it would choose the cell of interest. And in fact, um, I'm both embarrassed and proud of this paper back from the mid to early 90s, in which we put in neural stem cells into the cortex of an adult where it was missing pyramidal neurons, and we found that in a particular region, neurons were specifically selected out of that. But that was a very, very artificial system. It was the very first example of a stem cell could actually do cell replacement in the nervous system, particularly in an adult nervous system, but it actually sent us down the wrong path. We then made the assumption that we didn't need to know anything, we just needed to put the cells in the deficient environment, and the environment would fill in our gaps of ignorance. And that's wrong. Right? It's, 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 not, it, it's, it's far deficient in the explanation. The fact is, most natural environment, most natural diseases are really complex. They involve multiple cell types and multiple pathologic processes. And that's brought out by an experiment that we, we also did when we actually did a stroke-like lesion. Cooper Park in the group did a stroke-like lesion in, in a rodent and took the stem cells, put them on the opposite side, and I think as Heather mentioned, this is where we kind of first discovered some pathotropism, that cells over here would migrate to the area of injury. Here's the example of that on, a, on an intact side of the cells. The cells are blue, by the way. The stem cells engraft nicely, but stay right on this particular side, However, if there's a lesion on that side, something very different happens. The stem cells will migrate across commissures and corpus callosum, homing in on the infarcted area. And you can actually see this very nice, this shown over here, the very nice profile of the cells migrating across to the opposite side, homing right into this infarcted area. If you put the cells directly into the infarcted area, they never move back on the opposite side. In fact, they would fill out the entire infarcted area we can show over here that they really kind of fill in. I should also mention, cell therapy is going to require real-time imaging. So this whole process can be imaged under MRI in real time. They send processes across to the opposite side, presumably making connections uh, where they should make transcolosomy. But they also made other cells. They made oligodendrocytes cells and astrocytes. And in fact, we did get new neurogenesis after injury where you would never see it otherwise, but we saw other things as well. New oligodendrocytes, new astrocytes, even new stem cells. So in other words, I often say that even the dumbest stem cell is smarter than the smartest neurobiologist. <laughs> it knew that stroke is not just a loss of neurons, it's a loss of a whole, a whole vast area, and not just neural cells. It did give us neurons, but it gave us oligos, it gave us astrocytes. And the only way that it could do, which meant that it was smarter than we were, and it gave it in the exact right ratios. And that happened because of this axis of crosstalk. The stem cells were talking to each other. And when they talk to each other, there's a division of labor. 
And now some of the cells now know that what they need to do is not necessarily become neurons, but feed back, restore homeostasis to the host. And they do that through a whole series of factors. Some of them are diffusible. So you can imagine what's one way of using cell therapy. Well, if you have a cell that you put in and it distributes itself all throughout the brain, making a transgene, and one of those natural products is a lysosomal enzyme, well, does that mean now we can treat these heretofore untreatable kids with these CNS neurodegenerative disorders? And the answer is probably. There's already been a clinical trial based on that, a cell therapy clinical trial based on that. This is some of the preliminary uh, preclinical data showing that this animal with a kind of a form of Tay-Sachs disease can have prolonged motor function and prolonged lifespan doing that. But the cells make other things that are also very useful and it's still considered uh, cell therapy. They intrinsically make anti-direct anti-inflammatory molecules. Inflammation is a huge source of pathology. Neuroprotective molecules, anti-scarring molecules, mobilizing endogenous neuroprogenitor cells that can then send out they can promote vascularization of the host of a deficient area, so pro-angiogenic factors. Well, where would this be useful? Well, let's go to one well-known disease that lots of people think about for cell therapy, Parkinson's disease. And our model actually is a primate model of Parkinson's disease. I won't go into it, but it's actually a fairly authentic model of real patient Parkinson's disease. Monkeys that receive transplants <laughs> Uh, as opposed to those that simply, re simply uh, received nothing or a sham, had a diminution in their Parkinsonian score. In other words, the symptoms. It's not normal, but a, a pretty far fall. How did that happen? Well, it wasn't just one mechanism. Actually, the most non-contributory mechanism was replacing dopaminergic neurons. We saw it, we got it, but it was a very small percentage, certainly not enough to account for what was going on in these monkeys. What we saw a lot of, however, was protection of the monkey's own nigrostriadal pathways. So the donor cells, the donor human cells are these red dots over here. All the, the dopaminergic fibers in the nigra and out the striatum, these green, they all belong to the monkey, but notice how well preserved they are. You could actually now get preservation of the monkey's own nigrostriatal pathway. So in other words, this pathway, which degenerates in Parkinson's disease, was not replaced, but it was protected, and protected importantly, so that the animal's function was preserved. And then for unknown reasons, these lily bodies that normally you see both in patients and in the monkeys seem to be diminished. So there's some direct action restoring homeostasis to this animal. Together, these processes seem to allow an outcome which was favorable. But it wasn't just because we replaced dopaminergic neurons in a point-to-point -point response. What about in ALS? Well, same kind of thing. We've seen some dramatic improvement, extension in lifespan and in function, including respiratory function, which is the key to these animals living so long. We did not replace motor neurons, but what we did was significantly protect the motor neurons that the animal had, and therefore, the motor neuron out the ventral horn to the muscle. And because we're also interested in large animal models, we've now also created a large, a large animal, a monkey model, based on ricine being transported up the sciatic nerve to now create motor neuron degeneration in a monkey, where we can test therapies. Is it ALS? No. Is it segmental motor degeneration? Yes, and it'll be an opportunity for us to tell, test cell therapies. What about spinal cord injury? Um, I'm gonna indulge myself in showing you this because it's, it's, it's a great video. But again, we started off completely naive. We wanted to cut out a whole hemi resection of an adult spinal cord. The thinking was we would take a spinal, we'd take neural stem cells, layer them with a biodegradable scaffold to, to bridge the gap, fibers would come out like that, and we'd be heroes. You know, the, 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 the rat would walk, and we book a, a, a plane to stop. Let me show you the data, and then I'll show you what was, what was really going on. So here's an animal who received exactly that kind of hemi-resection, no treatment. And you can see that even though it's a hemi-resection, both 
lower extremities are severely affected. There's very, very little ambulation, uh, very poor weight support in the hindquarters, movement of just a few joints in the lower extremity, and on the 21-point BBB scale, this guy would only get maybe three out of 21. Now you're going to see the animal receive the stem cell supported by the scaffold, and he's not, the animal's not going to be normal by any means. But you're going to be able to see it's a tad better. Certainly a, a bit better ambulation and weight support in the hindquarters, movement of a few more joints in the lower extremity. And now on this 21-point scale, this guy would maybe get about a 14. So what was going on? Well, again, we thought, well, stem cells are the greatest thing since canned beer, and we should <laughs> cancel our plans for, you know, and book planes to stop them. Well, right in the epicenter, there were these fibers going through, both sensory and motor, but they weren't ours. They belonged to the, the ratty, but they belonged to the animal itself. There was some sprouting, some preservation, some moving across the opposite side, and only where the stem cells were, but also an inhibition of scarring, getting rid of formally an obstacle to this regenerative process. So the cells were necessary, but not for what we thought when we had an outcome. And now a large animal model has been devised where the same kind of thing is starting to, to be done, actually by a company, a company called Envivo, that's taking scaffolds seated with stem cells. And sure enough, in these monkeys, you do get diminished uh, inflammation and, uh, and also diminished degeneration, as you can see here. Now, is it just diffusible factors? Well. Cells actually making cell-cell contact also are important. We've never used to think about that, but literally the cells kissing each other and sending molecules through gap junctions, and we kind of reported that a few, a few years ago. Here's a Purkinje neuron in the cerebellum that normally should be dying, but it's not, and it's not dying because it's completely decorated by all these white dots. These green stem cells are literally kissing the cell body, making these gap junctions and putting something in there that completely reorders the internal metabolism. What are they doing? We really don't actually have a clue. We do know that certain things pass through gap junctions, including microRNAs, DNA, small molecules. And in one of our very rare mutants, we know that somehow it reorders this upstream effector that allows mitochondrial function and neurotrophic factor handling to be better but we don't know what it is, except that it can actually be mimicked by its own. So cell therapy kind of is not just cell replacement. It's all these mechanisms of rescue. At least that's the low-hanging fruit. But then you can say, well, when will you guys get to point-to-point -point replacement? You, you got some dopaminergic neurons, 3%, 5%. Can you get more? What we're starting to learn is that it's not enough to get a neuron. You have to be a very, very precise neuron. So, for example, going from here to saying you're pluripotent, now you're going to be neurectogen, we can do that. We can actually get very nice neurons, almost 100%. What their intrinsic fate, what their default fate is, is to become forebrain, usually excitatory interneurons. That's actually fairly easy to get, but that's not enough. What we're going to have to do is say, you're not just an interneuron. You're an interneuron that goes to this layer, bypasses going down the thalamus, and synapses just on this particular neuron and on not that particular neuron, which means fundamental development of biology and knowing all of that. If you want to get dopaminergic neurons, we're going to have to say, you know, you can't be forebrain anymore. Even though you're a neurectoderm, you got to go and now we've got to ventralize you and we have to put you in the, in the center part, in the midbrain, and you've got to talk to floor plate, and that's going to teach you to become that. So we can get dopaminergic neurons, but it's going to be very exquisite kinds of instruction. So does that mean that there is no cell therapy until we do that? Absolutely not. I think there will be. There are all these mechanisms that are already inherent to stem cell biology that are going to be useful. And then, whoops, sorry. Uh, then I'm going to just talk very quickly about this. And cell replacement, we'll get there, but it's going to take a lot of work, which means right now preserving what you have is probably going to be the key. That's the low-hanging fruit for cell therapy right now. 
Now, we mentioned that the cells can go wherever we, we can go all over, particularly to pathology. What about if you use these guys to deliver something they don't naturally make? I kept on talking about things they naturally make. What about if you put in something that you just want to deliver? Well, you would need this in a diffuse disease, untreatable disease, like brain tumors, whether they're primary or metastatic, glioblastoma. And sure enough, these cells, if you arm them with your favorite tumor-killing gene, will find the tumor and help eradicate it. This already is in clinical trials. Right now, my former postdoc, Karen Abudi, who was in my lab when we discovered this, is now an associate professor at City of Hope, leading a clinical trial, actually doing this. Now, I'm going to end by saying, what's a challenge that I've completely ignored in all this? So, I've talked about how we can use the cells for protection and changing the milieu and things of that sort. So, most of the pro most of the progress that has been made in any cell therapy field, that you see all the greatest papers, have always been in the acute or subacute or actively degenerating nervous system, for example, or it could be in the heart or the pancreas. But that's not where most disease is. Most of our patients are not freshly injured or just recently experienced their degenerating disease. And in fact, very often we're not even allowed to approach patients until they've failed every other, every other intervention. Chronic injury, chronic CNS injury, is where most of our patients are. And nothing that I've been talking about works there. So we've obviously missed the opportunity for protection. And in addition to that, and I won't read this, you can, all the other things that change. You already have atrophy of the muscles. Your blood vessels have, de have, have, de have disappeared. Your, your, your certain pathways have long ago had dying back pathology. You have encephalosis. You have cortical atrophy. How are we going to fix that? And I think we're misleading if we tell patients that are in wheelchairs that that latest paper that I or anybody else published on a spinal cord injury in rat walking is going to be good for them because it's not. Well, one way to do it is to still take advantage of them and say, what is it that's going on acutely that we can recreate chronically? Maybe we can recreate the milieu. And then there's other things that we're going to have to tackle. But again, this is fundamental developmental biology. Reorganization pathways, reorganization of cortical mass, trying alternative routes through the spinal, maybe through bioengineering, finding alternative pathways to the muscle and keeping muscles alive. And just entirely different paradigms, and they're all going to have to be multimodal. This is just one way that we've started approaching chronic spinal cord injury, meaning a combination of all this, cells that make molecules on scaffolds, and we're starting to make a little bit of progress. Here's, a, here's an animal who was lesioned, got some recovery, plateaued, and now we use that entire multimodal approach I just mentioned to show that now we can get him to make a little bit more progress and this represents some increased new functions that he can now acquire. He can now start supporting his weight, whereas he couldn't before, and fibers start going through a formerly chronic area. <coughs> so I'm just going to move to my conclusion slides now, so that I've given you all the kind of all of the, the challenges. The other challenge, by the way, and is what is the best cell to use? IPS cells or ESLs may be the best, but other times they may not. You need to really tame them. Sometimes you're going to want a cell that's already settled right within that lineage, like neural, with no risk of becoming heart or fat or something like that, and then you have to play with that. And then other people have gone to the bone marrow and used cells from one organ to try to treat another. And there's many companies that are based on that. I'm only going to add one caveat to that, and this was published last year, and this is the risk of putting something where it does not belong. So this was a case of putting mesenchymal stem cells into the brain. So taking the biology of one system and trying to put it into the biology of another system, which may be a no-no, even though we would love to do that, because what happened is 
the mesenchymal stem cells from the bone marrow in the brain in this model of multiple sclerosis did what mesenchymal stem cells that give rise to, to cartilage or to fat or to other things do. They responded to the inflammatory environment, they multiplied, they proliferated, and they made masses. So what you need to do is understand the disease and understand the biology of the cell and make sure that you're not working at cross purposes to that. Even if you're interested in therapy, know the biology of both the disease and the cell and, and go along with that, not what you think the cell should be doing. So I'd say in conclusion, talking about cell therapy still is viewing stem cells the way Matt talked about them, as models of development and disease, that cell therapy does involve reinvoking developmental processes, and particularly those developmental processes that already promote adaptation or plasticity. That's whether you're trying to do endogenous cells as your cell therapy or exogenous cells. Multiple mechanisms, multiple cell types will be necessary. Probably for cell therapy, the low-hanging fruit are these molecular therapies that I've been talking about. Protection, for example. But ultimately, I guess cell therapy will be disease in a dish, so it won't be the cell that goes into the patient, but the drug discovered from the cell that goes into the patient. I'm also a pediatrician, so even as we're talking about cell therapy, please, please don't forget the kids. They can actually be better models of adult diseases than the adults themselves. And this is going to be a huge, huge challenge to cell therapy. And how do we, how do we use that, even if we can start conquering some of these more acute or ongoing injuries? What are we going to do for most of our patients that are sitting over here? So with that, I'll be glad to take any questions. Thanks. Sort of uh, neuroimmunological approaches to the Carl Schwartz endowment mm -hmm. with yeah. uh, stem cell research. Yes. Stem cell therapy. Yeah. Uh, well, Michaela herself has tried to do that a lot. You know, it, 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 some of her work is very controversial, but it's also very complex. You know, because it's, it's, it's funny. Um, the stem cell and I'll tell you, is like a fireman. One of the mechanisms for tropism of the stem cell to a region of injury is the inflammatory cytokines that are expressed. I didn't go into this, but we, when we tried to understand what this pathotropism was, we learned that stem cells have, chemoch have chemokine receptors. The injury itself upregulates a whole host of and then the stem cell upregulates receptors to that, and that's how it homes, which is very clever. And then when it gets there, like a fireman goes to where the fire is, when it gets there, it actually then has some direct anti-inflammatory actions. Well, does this mean inflammation is good because that's how the stem cell gets there? No, it means it's complex. And we've tried to make some drugs that mimic the inflammatory chemokines without the inflammation, promote homing, but it's complex. And, and I think where Michaela where the controversy with Michaela is, is where is that tipping point between the inflammation that's going to be injurious and the inflammation that's going to promote self-repair because that's where the stem cell knows where to go. So, I, so the short answer is it's a, a very active area of investigation, but it's like most of as you can imagine, complex and a double-edged sword. Well, well it, you know, it's funny when, in the nervous system, when you talk about one cell making contact with another, we always believe that, that was what, what that was was simply a neuron synapsing onto another neuron. And of course, there would be this electrochemical great, uh, transport of, of quanta from one cell to another, and that was it. What we saw when we first started seeing this are a donor cell completely changing all the cells around it before it was mature enough to actually make electrically active synapses, which then said, well, how the hell could that happen? And then, so then we started saying, well, if it's not synapses, it must be other contact, and that's what we found out about the gap junction. So what you mentioned, that, that definitely happens. That is, that is the mainstay, but now, after we observed this, we kind of invited many people to start looking, and it's, it's everywhere. Lots of organ systems are starting to see this in not just neural stem cells, but mesenchymal stem cells and others. So it's an ongoing. 
other questions? Well, I'll